All right, guys, rainy Thursday afternoon. Amazing. It just Whenever I get time to shoot videos, it always amazes me that it's raining. So if it's raining, I'm making a video. Go check out Earl Gray. His channel is fantastic. He does uh, a series of videos that are all titled Panelology, and they have numbers after him. And uh, last week, weekend, something like that, he did two videos, you know, sort of talking about his top 20 favorite comic book uh, characters. And I went old school YouTube community, man. I didn't just jump in here and decide, hey, I'm going to do that. Uh, I'm kind of surprised I haven't already done it. Uh, maybe I have in the past eight years, but I know I definitely have a top 10 comics. But um, what I did is I just, you know, made a comment, said, do you mind if I do this? He said, go for it. Everybody's been looking for it. I should have had this uh, up a couple of days ago, but, you know, I have life. Um, now, I'm going to show somebody. I'm going to do, you know, two videos, 10 characters a piece. I was kind of floating through this. I did the whole thing, put some thought into it. Didn't really dig too much through the books because um, if I put this camera around and showed you what's in here, man, it's a disaster in here. You can kind of get a clue. So it's time, but I'm going to go ahead and show you one that didn't, that had to make the cut. Um, you know, and, and the thing about picking characters like this, like I said, I've done this uh, since 1977. I, c I could probably make a list uh, over and over and over of 20 through 11. But it's the top 10 that kind of stays stable a little bit, right? But somebody who didn't make the cut and it broke my heart was my Black Canary. So, goodbye, Dinah. I'm sorry, you know. But she's one of my favorites. Now, first character I'm going to show up here is Jor-El, number 20, okay? Um, a lot of people know the origin of Superman, like, you know, the back of their hand. It's been uh, in cartoons since the 40s and radio and comic books and... Uh, TV shows and, of course, our movies and stuff. And people have taken liberties with it and people have played around with it. Um, but I always go back to when I was a kid and I had a tabloid size edition of, I think, of was actual action number one in the late 70s. And the story just fascinated me because what I latched onto was the fact of Jor-El, right? So Jor-El is actually one of my favorite characters. This is one of the more original versions of him. You know, John Byrne updated him. Uh, Mark Wade, Leno Yu updated him. He's had different costumes. He's a black body stockings and everything like that. But I always go back to as close as we can to the original Jor-El, right? Um, because basically, you got to slow the story down, okay? Jor-El had a prototype. He had a son, a baby. He has his wife around him. And his planet is blowing up around him, right? It's certain death. And one of the things that people have played around with is the Superman symbol is not actually an S. On Earth, it looks like an S. But on Krypton, it's like a flowing river, okay? And it actually stands for hope. Now, if you slow down for a minute, and if you've ever held a baby, or if take a look at a baby, how small and fragile it is, um, the idea of putting it in a prototype rocket and shooting it into space, having a baby in a rocket to go light years across space, that's pretty heavy stuff. I mean, if you really take it down and get it as close to real world as you can, and when you slow it down, I mean, that is wild to do to take your baby and put it in there. I'm a father, okay? So, uh, years later, it's still kind of, I find that amazing. But when you take down the whole Superman mythos and you realize that it was certain doom, if he stayed on that planet, he would die. But there was hope that he might make it. Not a guarantee, just hope that he could find uh, himself on a planet and some really good people would be able to find this baby and raise him, right? That's just mind-blowing. Over the years, uh, I think the last time I really saw the origin in a comic was um, All-Star Superman, and Grant Morrison wrote that 12-issue maxi-series. Check it out. Uh, it's fantastic. They made a cartoon of it uh, straight to video. But he was playing around with the minimalism of, of storytelling, taking stories we all know, and, and how little, how, how much, how far could he go condensing the story? And one of the things he tried that with was the origin of Superman. I was like, I want to go the opposite way. I want to write my, if I ever wrote one comic, it would be the origin of Superman told through jor -El's eyes. And of course, when it comes to comic book history, Superman is the one that really blew up comics. So if jor -El hadn't sent his baby, none of that would have ever happened. Now, a more obscure character, this goes back to when I was a kid. Uh, this isn't nostalgia. This is going back to when I was 12 years old. And uh, I've always been a Jose Garcia Lopez fan, 
I hope I got that right. Um, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez fan, right? And one of the books, and I was into video games and stuff, one of the books I thought was cool, and it was one of the first books I talked about on YouTube somewhere in my first, you know, probably month or something, was Atari Force. Cheap book, easy to find, tons out there, didn't really blow up. Uh, it came out during the era when X-Men was real big. It can be compared to them and stuff, right? Um, even like Star Wars was affecting this thing, right? But, you know, it was, it's, it's of its era, and I love it and stuff, but it was a character named Blackjack. The only way I know to describe Blackjack is that he was a mercenary um, with a character named Dart, and more or less they were lovers and stuff, and Dart, ha Dart was like the hard luck hero, right? He was a bit of a wild card, quite a crackerjack a little bit, very Han Solo-like, you know what I mean? Like, uh, don't call me a good guy because you really you got to get to know me. Charismatic, smart aleck and stuff, cybernetic parts on him. 12 years old, sci-fi, guy has cybernetic parts. And I, th oh my God, the bad guy in this was called the Dark Destroyer, I think. The, the, yeah, anyway, something like that. But he actually took some of his essence and placed it in his brain cybernetically and stuff and took control of Blackjack. And this hard luck hero, you just got this whole, you felt bad for him because he's having to betray his lover, the Atari Force and stuff. Of course, he got saved by the Tazlings who replaced all the cybernetic parts and stuff, right? But the guy kind of went through hell emotionally, physically, um, and like I said, just very Han Solo-like. Um, goes back to when I was 12. I don't know anybody else in the world who's a fan. I really don't know if I'd push anybody there. I love the series. You know, it's one of my favorites from being a kid. Um, oh, man, I've lost track. 20, 19, 18 would be Doctor Doom. I really wanted to pull out Secret Wars number 10, but like I said, I'm not going to uh, bug out through this stuff. But, you know, when I was growing up in the late 70s and the early 80s and you picked up a comic book, and when I went back and read that Silver Age stuff that was laying around my house from my stepdad and my uncle and stuff and the Bronze Age stuff, super, super villain team up. Jim Shooter wrote Dr. Doom to where, you know, he was getting beat up by two or three villains and uh, by God, they weren't going to beat him. He grabbed two little torpedoes and smashed their heads together and was willing to blow himself up before the taste of defeat. Dr. Doom is a monarch that, uh, you know, pretty much has a iron clasp on his little country there, but, you know, he thinks he's the good guy. And there's no law against world domination that he wanted. He came in there and he's Reed Richards, you know, Reed Richards, and he'd give the whole Fantastic Four, you know, run for the money. It, it used to be when Dr. Doom uh, popped up, everybody went, oh, crap. Even Spider-Man would jump out of the way, and he would go after everybody, and he thinks he's the good guy. But the thing about Secret Wars is that he went after the Beyonder. If you guys don't know who the Beyonder is, he was the only being in his own universe, and he was om omnipotent, and he could do anything. And basically, he was God. And in the Secret Wars number 10, I think, is Secret Wars, I think, it was the last great, great Doctor Doom story. I don't think they've done them right since then, except maybe a few issues burned in a Fantastic Four after Secret Wars. But, um, basically, this was it, because he would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with God, and he actually defeated God. And it, it was not a real God, but the Beyonder, uh, in, uh, Secret Wars number 10, right? Um, and what's his big motivation? He's science, he's black magic, and he want, wanted to uh, rescue his mother from hell. You know, he played with the mystic arts, dark arts, science. Just, he was just a fascinating character and the man behind the iron mask and stuff, right? So I was at 18. I might get the number wrong. 17. I apologize. I could not find the box. I don't want to dig through those pile of boxes and stuff. I was going to pull out some of my beat up uh, Dale and Gold Key comics from the day. I went through the Valiant box from the 90s and just found pictures of uh, this character on covers. He's like that big and stuff like that. And I just got tired of digging. So I grabbed the cartoon that came out probably like about 10, 11 years ago, man. But Turok, Son of Stone. Turok, Son of Stone and uh, was a Native American. And he had, I can't remember, I don't think it was his son. I haven't read this in a decade and stuff. I still had the books. But anyway, but uh, he became trapped in the Lost Land. And in the Lost Land, it was full of honkers. Honkers are dinosaurs. And he had to survive in the strange land where you can go get a drink of water because a gigantic long neck dinosaur might come down and just take you down. You know, not crocodiles. They were there. And there was cavemen and, and all this stuff. And this started like in the 50s, I think. Went through the 60s and 70s and um, got picked up by Valiant and took off in a whole different direction. And it was just a mess, I think. But uh, this is one of the... This cartoon is probably on YouTube for free, but... Um, 
this is like really good. You'll get a good taste of them. There's it's there's some Frank Frazetta inspired uh, K men in this and stuff like that. But it was just so fantastic. I, I like when things go primitive. I like when it's man versus nature. I like things like that where he learns to survive and adapt. Uh, they they made arrows and found a poison that could kill the hunkers and stuff like that. Uh, it's just fantastic. So let me count here. <laughs> Twenty. 19, 18, 17, 16, uh, is Jaka from um, Cerebus. Uh, a character who in the 300 issue run really did not show up that much. Uh, she was a exotic dancer, if you will. Uh, this the feet and things like that. She was an exotic dancer uh, in this, and she was the most normal character in this, in this, in this, this comic book that touched on religion, philosophy, feminism, just all sorts of thing. In the middle of this, you have the thread of Jaka, of Cerebus's heart belonging to Jaka. Because, you know, over in time, we all have a Jaka, I'm sure. If you really sit down and admit it and stuff like that. And she's the most normal character. And Dave Sim put up a couple of videos talking about where Jaka came from. Jaka was actually based on a real girl that he was involved with around the time he got married. He's very honest about it, and he pulls in some movies where certain actors or characters in these movies influenced her. And Jocka's story is the one that really, I can go back and say issue like 112, 113. I can name off books that have service that I read here and there, the epic and things. But it was really Jocka's story that cemented it uh, for me that I'm going to read the service book, right? She's just fantastic. Um, it, it's nowhere is to love her. Um, she does what she has to do. She's selfless. Selfless. Her dancing is more of an art that's outlawed. Um, and she mesmerizes anybody that watches her. You know, um, like, uh, Dave Sim really has some passion here when he drew her uh, dancing and stuff. I'm sure that's showing up. Hair flowing. Uh, shows everybody watching her. Um, but the one that got me was, like, this page. Yeah, I mean, if you really look into her eyes, man, he can put something in there just smoldering. Just a master of his craft. Yeah, it's just fantastic. So I think we're at 15 or something, right? Now, as a kid, this is actually one of the first comics I read. And one of the characters in this just grabbed me. And over the years, he had very few appearances. I might have saw him in, a, in a Avengers here and there. It was his silence. Uh, I think writers may have dodged him because he was the strong silent type. He's also supposedly the last of his race, most much much like the Guardians of the Galaxy were, you know, stuff like that. But he's pretty much the last of his race. Um, very Native American influence, thus the Turok. I mean, I'm seeing a thing, you know, I'm seeing things that grab my attention and stuff, right? But it's uh, Yondu. Uh, this is from Thor Annual Number Six, 1977. It's where uh, I saw that red fin and those blue, that blue skin, and the fact that the guy had this magic metal, more or less, that when he shot the arrow, he could whistle or control it. Um, I mean, I've just always have been a Yondu fan. Now, with the Marvel movies, there he is. That's a, I think that's a Gene Colan. Just awesome character. Strong, silent, wise. Um, thought he was the last of his race. It's just fantastic stuff. And what got me uh, about him is that the character is so strong that when the Guardians of the Galaxy movies came out, the, the, those Guardians of the Galaxy movies are my favorite Marvel movies. I don't even feel like they're part of the Marvel Universe. They're just fantastic. The change in Yondu was so radical that I should have been a disgruntled fan, just all mad and stuff. But that's the magic of some of these Marvel movies. I saw Dum Dum Dugan, one of my favorite characters, if not on the list, in, in a Captain America movie. And I see Yondu front and center there in there. Nothing like he is in the comic book. We got the skin. They explained the fin a little bit different. Oh, just so opposite of what he is, yet I still loved him. I, I, I still feel like I got to see Yondu. It was just amazing. Next on the list, Hellblazer, John Constantine. Um, John Constantine was a character that I looked up and got to see the magic unfolding, got to see John Constantine pop up in Swamp Thing before he got his own series. Saw him pop up, uh, in a, maybe a half minute in, uh, Crisis on Infinite Earth. This was such a strong character. This goes back to Stephen Bicet, John Totalbun, or somebody like that, that was working with Alan Moore on, uh, Swamp Thing. And they were huge Sting fans, and they wanted a character like Sting. And we come up with this urban magician who ages in real time with us and 
got his own series and there was a big journey there that explains a lot of things about John Constantine and his darkness and how if you run across his path, something bad is probably going to happen to you if he doesn't just flat out screw you over. You get around him and stuff, right? But uh, John Constantine had a mystique about him to the point that Alan Moore supposedly told a story saying that the character the character was so strong or something that he was like in a uh, tavern or something in um, England and you had to go downstairs to get in it off the street, you know, so there was no back door or anything. And he said that this character, this guy had come in with blonde hair and a trench coat and it reminded him of John Constantine. He said, I need to talk to you. Come with me. And he went to a back room. Alan Moore freaked out a little bit, finished his pint, went back there in the room and the man had disappeared. Other people had seen him. You know, so it's just a strong, strong character. His series, I've been trying to collect the, you know, all 300 issues of the Hellblazer series, and I'm well over two thirds of it, but the series is so hit or miss that I kind of lost steam getting it because I've read a few story arcs where I was just like, oh my, oh no. Then I read a few that were just fantastic. Hellblazer number 11, if you like the movie Hell House and you like the punk scene of the 70s, you really need to read that issue. Okay, now, we're down to two characters here as kind of a cheat. Um, what are we on? Number 14. Uh, but they go together. Uh, Cain and Abel. All right? Cain and Abel. This is from the Sandman series. It's really got... Uh, Neil Gaiman was a genius and pulled him front and center. But they're exactly what they sound like. They're, they're aspects, if not the Cain and Abel, from the book of Genesis and the Bible and stuff. Son of Adam and Eve. Uh, you know, the, the, the gardener and, and the, sh the sheep herder, the sacrifice, the first murderer, if you will, the mark of Cain where nobody can touch you and stuff, right? Right in there and stuff. Uh, but the, the first time I saw him, you know, it was probably Neil Adams, uh, drawing Cain in House of Mystery and Abel was over here in the House of Secrets. And Sergio Argonus would have them with a character named Eve who had a crow and plop, you know, kind of a little bit of humor, dark humor and stuff, right? But those characters just fascinated me. They were horror hosts, you know, and I was just always like, why can't they have their own book? They're great. The way Kane would talk to kids, the way with Abel would try to share secrets and stuff and be afraid of Kane and would, you know, just the, the, the aesthetics, the way they looked was just so cool to me and stuff. So, you know, when I pick up House of Mystery and stuff, I really can't honestly think of one issue of House of Mystery or House of Secrets that I ever bought because they're, you know, cover it was because you know i was getting to see kane and abel they were just so cool and stuff and what neil game game did with them in sandman was just genius i mean he expanded them they got their own story in the dreaming they were characters kane was used as an envoy to go to lucifer and tell him that sandman was coming to hell to visit him uh and uh, he had the mark of uh, kane on him which means he could not be hurt nor touched or you would get the wrath of god on you and stuff like that and just fantastic how he just took those characters and expanded them. And I know some of the backstory about where they got their look. It's tied to Lynn Wine and stuff, right? Uh, keeping up there with um, the, Neil, the Neil Gaiman stuff there. Uh, death. Now, I'll go back and forth. When it comes to the Endless of Sandman, or it comes to a Neil Gaiman Sandman story, I go really go back and forth uh, with those characters. I mean, I love Sandman. I love Morpheus. He got knocked out of, the, out of this and stuff, right? Because basically, when it comes to actual character, you know... Sandman is just like Tim Burton being just all, you know, from, you know, Robert Smith from The Cure and stuff, or Neil Gaiman himself. You know, I'm, I'm an artist. I'm dark. I'm mysterious. I'm depressed. I'm a hopeless romantic. Then you have Death, who comes in there. And that's how she should be. That should be her personality. But she's really somebody that when you die, it's her. She's got open arms there. And she makes you feel better about it. It's not, you know, it takes away dark, uh, the darkness of it, right? Now, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but Sam Keith supposedly left the series because of uh, disagreeing with this version of death. You see her, she's beautiful, she's familiar, and you're comfortable with her. And she's going to say something like, she's the Mary Poppins of the afterworld. She's going to take you where you need to go and stuff like that, right? Of course, it's Tori Amos is a fan. She's posed for this cover and things like that. She's been used here and there. Uh, she has a huge fan. She was one of the characters, along with Morpheus, that brought you know females into comics uh, in the, with the Vertigo series where she would pop up. And uh, when it came to the time for one aspect of Morpheus to die and stuff, she was right there with her brother, harkening back to her first appearance uh, in Sam and Number 8. But uh, just such a fantastic character. And I guess we're at number 11 here. 
Uh, and I'm really surprised that I knocked this guy down so low on the list. Uh, I'm sure he'd be in the top five and stuff. But uh, Martial Law. Martial Law is one of those characters that, to me, this is the trilogy of one, one of the trilogy of the 80s that really made comics grow up and grew up with its audience and stuff, right? And he's more relevant now than he was back then. I mean, it was the grim and gritty time of Watchmen and Dark Knight, and up comes Martial Law. Martial Law hates heroes. You read this book, the, the art is so jarring, it takes you a minute to, you never saw anything like it back then, really. It's so jarring that you, you really had to take it in. And then it, it, the storytelling in it, in it is like a razor blade coming at you. You know, but basically martial law is a, I can't remember if he's a cop or something, but, uh, it's a little bit of a post-apocalyptic world, I guess, and stuff. And everybody got superpowers due to government experiments, sending them to this world's version of uh, Vietnam. And they come back with PTSD and, uh, just nuts and stuff. And, um, it calls out the hypocrisy of vigilantism of heroes. Martial law hates heroes. You know, he's a deputized marshal. Uh, so he goes after him to take him down because they're breaking the law. And this really speaks on, uh, thin, this speaks with thinly veiled heroes and villains, if you will, of the mainstream. You know who these guys are. You know that's Batman. You know that's supposed to be Superman and stuff. There's ongoing plots. And he kind of uh, peels back in a very knife-to-the-heart way. He peels back the veil of things that you forgive with our heroes and stuff and calls out the hypocrisy. And I'm going, and, and there's, there's a lot of that going on now. There's a lot of people who think they're the good guys that want to do thought policing and control what's on the internet. And they've affected games and Marvel Comics and DC Comics and Star Wars and stuff, right? So I've seen all this stuff before. Uh, this was the martial law book that got me hooked. This was a Dark, dark uh, Horse special, number one, where basically martial law, uh, Super Babylon, that's what it's called, and he ends up going after the Golden Age heroes and references World War II and things and Captain America and stuff, right? All right, guys, that's, uh, I think, 20 through 11. Look out for, you know, the final 10 who made Howler Mouse's top 10.